right, hey guys. So if you're a long-time listener, you're probably aware of what I do for a living. I have a graphic design degree, and I do some freelance design work on the side. But my main job still, for some reason, is working construction with my family. Well, recently, uh, we've been remodeling an attic in Somerville, Massachusetts. And while gutting the floor, I found some really interesting stuff. The bays between the joists were stuffed with old newspapers from the 1940s. Might not sound too exciting, but some of the headlines and the stories were mind-blowing. So I thought I'd share them with you guys. So if this is your first time listening or watching, yes, this is usually a podcast for atheists, agnostics, and yes, whoever. But today I thought I'd break from the norm. So here we go. And uh, instead of saving the piece de resistance for last, I guess, uh, I just butcher that French anyway, uh, I guess uh, instead I'll start with it instead of uh, keeping you guys waiting. And just a heads up, I don't think I'm going to do an audio-only version of this one. It relies so heavily on the visuals. They'll probably upload a video version of this to uh, Podbean as well and not just YouTube. But anyway, so this is pretty incredible. So I found a copy of the Boston Post that's dated Friday, November 16th, 1945. And this is like a front page that someone would make up if they were trying to, you know, capture the spirit of the 1940s. All together on the same front page, we have a mention of Hitler, a mention of Pearl Harbor, a reference to the Russians. It sounds like something that you'd find in the National Enquirer or something, but in big letters, reveal Hitler had daughter. Photos found in Eva's or Ava, they must be referencing Ava Braun. Ava's treasure chest show Fuhrer in all sorts of poses with blonde baby girl. Taken from infancy through age of three. Child named Ushi, I think it is, believed born in 1941. Chest also contains one million silver set and hundreds of valuable gifts from Hitler. Ava's diary speaks often of her undying love. And so I wasn't sure if if Hitler had children. I didn't think he did, at least not according to the mainstream narrative. So I looked online and, and the mainstream consensus seems to be that he didn't have children, although there are theories to the contrary out there. Then right there in the middle, we have the Queen of Pigtails. Um, I don't think that's an official uh, designation. I wonder what her duties are as the Queen of Pigtails and how extensive her authority is. Uh, but then to the left, the first story on the page, U.S. new Japs would attack. And it's probably jarring to a lot of people's ears to hear, you know, a mainstream newspaper referring to the Japanese as Japs and right below it referring to the Russians as Reds. Uh, but this would have been very common for the time. And of course, we were at war with the Japanese at the time. But even so, very politically incorrect, according to our modern standards. It would kind of be like us referring to uh, ISIS as towel heads or something. Now, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I love watching conspiracy theory videos. I'll watch Alex Jones sometimes. Um, I'll even watch really off-the-wall stuff like uh, David Icke presentation and things like that. And I forget what I was watching. Maybe I was watching some 9-11 conspiracy videos or something, but they were talking about the government knowing about Pearl Harbor beforehand and maybe even trying to suggest that Pearl Harbor was a false flag. And then literally a day or two later, I found this newspaper in the floor of uh, the attic that we were gutting and uh, U.S. knew Japs would attack, learned war plans months before Pearl Harbor by solving code, pro bear secret messages. And I didn't know the Associated Press had been around this long, but it, it's uh, the article begins, and it's hard to read that fine print, but Washington, November 15th, AP, that must be Associated Press. And then below, as I referenced earlier, there's that story about the quote-unquote Reds. Reds to get chance to share Adam. And this is kind of funny because the newspaper's dated 1945, so that would have been around the end of World War II. 
And the Cold War didn't begin until, what, like 1947? And already they're talking about Reds getting a chance to uh, share Atom. And that must be a reference to, you know, the technology behind the Atom Bomb. And then there's some miscellaneous stories. Trawler hits rocks to drown. Uh, so, you know, when people talk about the good old days, I always want to say there were no good old days. You know, here we are with these newspaper articles from uh, more than half a century ago. And, you know, talk about war, dictators, people dying in random accidents. So I, I really don't think there really ever were any good old days. And it's funny, I was almost going to... Uh, tweet this image to Alex Jones just for fun, but I didn't want my followers to think I was a conspiracy theorist or, or whatever. But it'd be fun to see how conspiracy theorists uh, would react to something like that, what they'd make of it. And as far as the government knowing about Pearl Harbor beforehand, I thought it was kind of common knowledge that there may have been some chatter about a possible uh, attack on Pearl Harbor uh, beforehand, you know, just what I've gleaned from History Channel documentaries and things like that. But here's a little bit from Wikipedia. It says, from the 1950s, several writers alleged that parties high in the U.S. and British governments knew of the attack in advance and may have let it happen or even encouraged it with the aim of bringing the U.S. into war. However, this advanced knowledge conspiracy theory is rejected by mainstream historians. And like I said, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But it, it, it's kind of it's kind of wild to see it right there in a 1945 newspaper. U.S. knew Japs would attack. Then this one caught my eye because uh, I, I'm a lifelong sufferer of allergies and asthma. Um, why am I working construction when I have allergies and asthma? I don't know. Once again, I must be some kind of masochist. But uh, this article talks about the discovery of a new drug. The University of Illinois, blah, 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 some of the articles missing. A medicine announced yesterday discovery of a new drug it said brings marked symptomatic relief from hay fever and asthma and other common allergies. And then it says the drug Benadryl. <laughs> so, you know, Benadryl is a very common allergy medication, and it's probably considered kind of you know, old school now. And uh, there it is, the discovery of Benadryl. Maybe I'm kind of nerdy, but I actually found that really interesting. I'm trying to think which is the one that um, people use to make crystal meth. Uh, was it Benadryl or was it Sudafed? But I remember, was it like a few years back, they started moving all these over-the-counter antihistamines and decongestants and things behind the counters uh, to keep people, what they call them on uh, Breaking Bad, Smurfs. <laughs> the people that'll go into the pharmacies or the drug stores and gather up all the uh, over-the-counter drugs into uh, backpacks or steal them or whatever so they can be used to manufacture crystal meth. Then we have a kind of strange article. Seems like something you'd find uh, on the front of some tabloid. Uh, Jungle gives up Wolf Boy. And those images actually look familiar. I think I may have seen those images in... Uh, like a history or discovery documentary about uh, feral kids or whatever. Now, this was pretty timely. You guys will probably remember that recently there was a film released called uh, Trumbo, and it was I think it was about the McCarthy hearings and the, the kind of uh, anti-communist witch hunts that were going on and a lot of different people in the Hollywood community being targeted. And one of the figures that was targeted uh, was Dalton D. Trumbo, and they just made a movie about him. And here is an article ab about Trumbo, uh, for facing prison in red movie probe. And of course, red referring to uh, you know communism or communists. In rapid fire order, contempt actions were started against three more Hollywood screenwriters yesterday after they defiantly refused to tell the House Committee on Un-American Activities whether they are communists. So I thought that was really interesting too. And I don't know if this is a local paper or not. It's called The Daily Record. Professor Slay's Family of Four. And then it must be local because it's referencing the hub. 30,000 gems stolen in hub hotel holdup. So once again, if anyone tells you how they miss the good old days when everything was puppy dogs and rainbows, you know, here we have a professor supposedly slaying a family of four. 
Uh, we have a jewel heist. And I think one of the papers I didn't hang on to talked about a 14-year-old girl being knifed. Another one talked about an army vet murdering his wife. So as long as there's been people, you know, there, there's been awful stuff going on. And then up above, we have, uh, oh, the Colgate Comedy Hour, <laughs> Abbott and Costello, Eddie Cantor, and Bob Hope. Let's see. Next up, ah, how'd that get in there? That's a proboscis monkey. Um, get your new Philco <laughs> radio. Full-size Philco table radio, only nineteen ninety-five. Pay 50 cents weekly. Then uh, here's another disturbing story. Engineer killed at throttle. Open door hits his head as train speeds by. Eisenhower is new army head. Uh, then there's a story about a General Motors strike. Let's see. Then here's another story about Ava Braun. Ava wails at faults of Hitler. Diary shows he was crude and often untrue to her. Threats to kill herself revealed. And for a minute, I was going to say, I was wondering if part of this was to kind of uh, tear down the enemy in the eyes of the American people and maybe to try to uh, embarrass Hitler. But this newspaper is from November 1945. And I think Hitler died, was it April 1945? So, but it's kind of funny. So there's these tabloid-esque stories in uh, a kind of mainstream newspaper. And I don't know, I don't think they have this anymore, do they? They have these little, like, inspirational quotes or fortune cookie wisdom up at the top of the newspaper. It is a noble and great thing to cover the blemishes and excuse the failings of a friend. I'm tempted to go off on a philosophical tangent about that, but I'll try to rein myself in. I was going to say there might be some merit to the argument that you shouldn't let your friend go through life as a unaware jackbag who keeps making mistakes. But on the other hand, uh, yeah, I guess it, it's it's definitely nice to accept your friends despite their failings. To me, that would be part of the definition of a friend. Um, what that other one, the first one, say at the top? It is better to fall among crows than flatterers, for those devour only the dead, these the living. And that's a quote from Antisthenes, I think. Yeah, an ancient Greek philosopher. I actually like that one. Then as an atheist or a non-believer, uh, I kind of like this one. Um, Sees no surge to religion by vets. Bishop Sherrill says post-war spiritual revival up to laymen willing to make some sacrifices. So the, the gist seems to be that vets returning from the war don't seem to be so hot on spirituality or going to church. So it's kind of up to, uh, you know, the laymen and civilians. And, and that doesn't surprise me. I think a lot of us have probably heard anecdotal stories about people who come back from war and... Um, have an aversion to church or conflicted feelings about God and things like that. And it probably has to do with all the carnage and horror they see over there. I remember a, a good friend of mine, uh, maybe I'll abstain from giving out his name, but but a really close friend of mine, I remember when we were growing up, his, his father was a Vietnam vet and his father did not like going to church. His mother was really religious and insisted on taking the kids to church, but the dad wouldn't go. Because he basically said after what he saw over there, he just couldn't buy into the religion thing. He couldn't bring himself to go to church. And that's a really creepy photo. It looks like it was probably water damaged over the years. The people in the photo almost look like uh, reptilians or burn victims or something. It's kind of creepy. Oh yeah, then I found a matchbook under the floorboards. <laughs> Old Nick. Isn't Old Nick like a euphemism or an epithet for the devil? I think it is. And Wikipedia says Old Nick can mean an English name for the devil from Christian belief. A milk chocolate candy bar originally manufactured by Sugar Johnson Company of Chicago. Old Nick Bear, Old Nick Magazine. An American adult magazine. What kind of adult material is in a magazine called Old Nick? Probably not anything I'd want to see. Pictured like... Uh, wrinkly old guys with like sharp skin or something uh <laughs> pardon my inappropriate sense of humor you know there had to be at least a little bit of it in here uh old nick creamy fudge luscious caramel roasted nuts coated with thick rich chocolate i wouldn't mind eating one not if it was from 1945 though 
And this caught my eye as an artist. One of those ads that like you still see now. If you can draw this, you know, you may be able to get into our art institute or whatever. Um, it's probably too late to enter this one. I might actually try to draw that though, just for the heck of it. Then talk about there not being any good old days. I couldn't believe I found a reference to this story. This one's from 1947. That says something about boy grilled and slaying, seized as a suspect in Dahlia's death. And at first I'm like, wow, is this the Black Dahlia they're talking about? And then yeah, it says down in quotes, Thorpe was under prolonged questioning last night, many hours after he had been detained in Merced, California, in connection with the mutilation murder of the quote-unquote Black Dahlia, 22-year-old Elizabeth Short of Medford. I didn't know she was from Medford. I actually have a very close family member who lives in Medford, and uh, we do some work in Medford sometimes. One of the victims of the Boston Marathon bombings uh, was from Med Medford, uh, um, a young woman who didn't survive, one of the people who was actually not just maimed but killed. But uh, the Black Dahlia story, I think they made at least one movie about it, and this is one of those stories that haunts me, and, you know, the images of the murder scene are, like, forever frozen in my mind. I was almost going to include them in this video, but, uh, I mean, everyone's different, and, and I don't know how strong some of your stomachs are. But th this was a woman, a young woman, Elizabeth Short. She was an aspiring actress, and, um... Supposedly very attractive, but I think there were some post-death rumors about her, whether she may have been maybe what we would call now intersexed or something like that, or if there was something wrong with her genitalia. But I think all that might have just been rumor. But anyway, she was found brutally murdered. She was basically cut in half. And then someone gave her, I guess, I think it's sometimes called a Glasgow smile, when they, almost like a Joker smile when they kind of extend your smile by um, slicing deeply into your cheeks. So the the photographs, even though they're black and white, are really grisly. They're out there for anyone to find. I didn't really feel like looking at them again, and I didn't want to really disturb anyone by including them in this video, but you can find them easily enough. Just Google the Black Dahlia, Elizabeth Short, or whatever. Yeah, so it's basically the photo show. I think it's. I think she's nude. Her nude body severed. The two halves of the body, probably like a foot or a couple of feet away or apart. And, you know, this hideous grin carved into her face. And I think it's always been a mystery who exactly committed the crime. So it kind of blew my mind when I saw a headline about a possible suspect. And I just thought it was kind of wild. You know, if you saw this in a movie, someone finding old newspapers in a floor or underneath floorboards, and they had to do with all these high-profile stories, you'd probably think it seemed unrealistic, you know? Oh, how convenient. But it, it, yet I found all these stories. And then this is one about uh, some kind of politician, Joseph E. Rossetti, secretary to Congressman John F. Kennedy. So that's pretty wild. Then I think these people might be relatives of Drew Barrymore. Drew Barrymore comes from Hollywood royalty. So let's see, Diana Barrymore, daughter of the late famed John Barrymore. So I just looked it up on Wikipedia. Drew Barrymore is the daughter of John Drew Barrymore, who is actually the half-brother of the woman in this picture. So that's pretty wild. And then... <laughs> Then lastly, here's an Aunt Jemima ad, for, you know, Aunt Jemima pancakes or syrup or whatever that would definitely be considered very politically incorrect today that you definitely would not see today. Not only, you know, it's not the gla the animated glass bottle. It's actually they're showing a black woman with a scarf on her head, kind of looks like a house slave. It actually reminds me of uh, some high-profile male comedian. Is it uh, Kenan Thompson? <laughs> Uncanny, actually. And it's using this stereotypical kind of black language that maybe, you know, slaves would have used or whatever. Glory be, folks, show chair for light, happify, and Aunt Jemima pancakes. Oh, my. Yeah, you definitely would not see that today. 
But that's it. Yeah, so today's episode really didn't have much to do with atheism or anything, but I don't know if it's just the nerd in me. I, I found all this kind of fun, and, and I hope you guys found it interesting and entertaining too. But I guess that's a wrap. You guys know the drill. You can like the Facebook page. You can subscribe or rate the show via iTunes. You can check out the YouTube channel. Maybe you're doing that right now. You can go to Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N, and check out the archives all the way back to episode one. If you want to help the show out monetarily, you can donate using the PayPal widget at the bottom of the Podbean page. There's all that alliteration. Donate as little as 99 cents. Or you can go to patreon.com slash theweekendout and donate as little as uh, 99 cents or a dollar a month to help support the show and quit anytime you want. And a heads up to my Patreon supporters. I think there's um, eight of you guys now, and I really, really appreciate it. We're basically up to the point where you guys are basically covering the cost now of hosting the feed. It costs me about 19 bucks a month to host a feed through Podbean. And uh, I've explained it before on the show, and if any of you guys are interested or, you know, playing around with the idea of starting your own podcast, you can't just upload something directly to iTunes. You need a middleman. You need a place where you can host your feed, either your own server or a friend with a server, or like me, uh, you know, you have to use a service like Podbean. They allow you a place to host your feed. Then you get your show approved through iTunes. Once that's done, you provide iTunes with your RSS feed. That allows the feed to be updated through iTunes so listeners can find your most recent content in their uh, podcast library, etc. And uh, yes, yeah, so, but anyway, I want to say to you, Patreon guys, um, not just thank you, but for a long time, I was offering exclusively for Patreon supporters a kind of more polished version of the brief history of St. Patrick audio documentary I did. But that's been up there for a long time, and I feel like the Patreon account is more about you guys helping to maintain the show as it is, rather than me constantly providing you guys with bonus material. It's kind of you guys saying, uh, hey, I like what you're doing, keep going, you know. Um, and I appreciate that very much. But I finally took the brief history of St. Patrick audio documentary and turned it into a YouTube video. And hopefully none of you Patreon guys are bothered by that, me taking exclusive Patreon content, turning it into YouTube content. Hopefully not. But speaking of that, I mean, if I'm wrong and you guys are looking for bonus content, just let me know. You know, I also read an H.P. Lovecraft short story that's up on Patreon just for the uh, the Patreon supporters. Uh, it's H.P. Lovecraft's The Tomb, and that's still up there. If you guys want me to do more audio books like that, if you want me to read uh, more old horror stories that are in the public domain, I'd be happy to do that. If you guys want more embarrassing personal stories, I'll up that to Patreon. Speaking of that, I almost thought of doing, I was going to turn it into a podcast at some time, but maybe I might do it as bonus Patreon content. But I was going to create a podcast called Drug Stories, <laughs> where I basically devote a whole episode to each substance that I've experimented with. You know, it start off each episode by talking about what the drug actually does to you chemically, give a little bit of scientific or pharmacological background on the drug, and then go into offering some personal anecdotes. So maybe I do like marijuana, you know, one episode, then like MDMA, another episode or whatever, even alcohol. Hopefully any of you guys who are against drugs out there don't think I'm a degenerate scumbag for suggesting this. But, uh, but I thought it would be kind of an interesting thing to do, so you guys can let me know what you think. And uh, But I guess that's it. So until next week, thanks, guys.